There is no other place in the world that lets you go to your phone, open up an app, and almost instantly become a part owner in some of the greatest companies in the world, right? Apple, Google, Amazon, Tesla. In this massive beginner's guide video, I'm gonna walk you through step-by-step -step everything that you need to know about the stock market to begin investing and building wealth. This is a beginner's guide to the stock market, a step-by-step -step ultimate guide. Okay, so this is kind of going to be a preface to the video. Um, I wanted to go ahead and provide you guys with as much value as I possibly could before the video even began. And so what you'll see on the screen here are a few different resources, uh, brokers that are giving away free stocks just for opening up an account and depositing a small amount of money into your account. So we've got Webull, which at the time of this recording, if you open up a Webull account and deposit just one penny, you can get six free stocks valued up to $12,600 with a minimum of $34 dollars guaranteed uh, when you use the link in the description below. Public is also giving away one free stock worth up to $300 when you sign up using the link. Okay, so with all that being said, let's jump into part number one, which is the essentials of the stock market. So in this part of the video, we're going to go over all of the fundamentals, all of the basics and essentials of what exactly the stock market is, what are stocks, as well as several other very important key topics that you'll really want to understand first before you actually begin investing your money into the stock market. Now, before we we actually begin talking about all of the practical stuff like what the stock market is what are stocks i want to first ask you a very important question just to get your mind sort of working right why exactly should you invest in the stock market in the first place? If you're not investing your money, there are two really bad things happening to your money at the same time. The first bad thing that's happening to your money is that over the years, it's losing value due to inflation. So what exactly does that mean? Well, let's just imagine that, for example, back in the year 1970, like 50 plus years ago, that your grandfather put $1,000 into his savings account. Fast forward 50 plus years later, we are now in present day and your grandfather comes to you and he says, hey, I've got this big gift for you. I've been saving it for 50 plus years. It's been sitting in my savings account and I finally am ready to give it to you. Here's $1,000. I want you to go enjoy yourself. Go buy yourself a nice new used car or perhaps go to Best Buy and buy yourself a new Apple MacBook Pro, a new Apple Watch, a new 70 inch flat screen TV because I gave you $1,000 and I know that you can go and buy all that stuff with $1,000. And so you look at your grandfather with pity and compassion and you say to him, uh, Grandpa, you only gave me $1,000. I can't, I can't buy any of that stuff. Like I might be able to buy a new 70 inch flat screen TV, but that's really about it. And so he looks at you and he responds and says, are you kidding me? It's a thousand dollars. Of course you can buy that stuff. I just gave you a thousand dollars. Your grandfather is not totally wrong. In fact, $1,000 back in 1970 was equivalent to having about $8,000 today. In other words, back in 1970 with just $1,000, you could technically have bought all of that stuff because the value of $1,000 was worth a lot more back in 1970 than it is today. And this right here is inflation. It's the general increase of the price of goods and services over time. It's not that your money is decreasing over time, right? Because $1,000 back in 1970 is still $1,000 today. It's just that what that $1,000 can buy you today compared to what it could have bought you back in 1970 is a lot less. And so the easiest way to combat this, the easiest way to fight inflation is by investing your money into the stock market. Don't let it just sit in the bank like how your grandfather did, right? Because if it's just sitting in the bank, then it's losing value over time due to inflation. Okay, so inflation is the first bad thing that's happening to your money if you're not investing it into the stock market. But the second bad thing that's happening to your money is that if you're not investing it, then you're likely spending it somewhere else. And so, for example, if you're making $50,000 per year and you aren't investing a single penny of that, then odds are you're probably spending $50,000 as well. And so what's happening is year after year, you're working hard, you're making all this money, but then at the end of the year, you've spent all the money that you just earned. Instead, what you should be doing is forcing yourself to save and invest some of that money so that your money is actually able to work for you and build your wealth for the future. When you turn 65, chances are you're probably not gonna wanna work anymore, right? You're gonna wanna hang out with your grandchildren or go fishing at the pond. But if you haven't been saving and investing, 
testing, then you really won't have much of a choice but to continue working. Or alternatively, you could just try and live off of these small social security checks that the government sends you every single month, if that's even still a thing by the time you turn 65. So start investing today. Start investing right now after you finish watching this video because your future self depends on you. I'm serious. Your future self is depending on you to, to start investing right now. And don't worry because a little bit later on in this video, we're going to go over exactly how to start investing, what to invest in, how to open up a brokerage account. We'll even walk through step by step and I'll show you a real live example of me buying and selling stocks on the stock market while it's open so that you can see just how easy it is. Okay, so aside from those reasons, why else should you be investing in the stock market? Well, another reason is that thanks to our modern technologically driven society, investing in the stock market has never ever been more easy and accessible than it is today. Right now, today, literally anybody can go to their phone, open up a free brokerage account within five to 10 minutes and start investing their money into the stock market and building their wealth for the future. I'd like to transition now and talk about what exactly is the stock market? Like, is it this magical place somewhere in Narnia that people go to to make money? Like, what is it exactly? Well, technically, the stock market isn't just a single place. Like when most people think of the stock market, they might think of like Wall Street in New York, right? But that's not actually the stock market. The stock market is actually a very broad term used to describe the collection of exchanges uh, used by companies to sell shares of their stock of their company, uh, as well as other securities to investors like you and I. Now, these individual exchanges do include places like the New York Stock Exchange, which is the one on Wall Street, which is the one that most people think of when they think of trading stocks. Uh, it also includes places like the NASDAQ. And these are going to be the two that you hear about the most, especially here in America, right? But you've got like the London Stock Exchange and you've got over 60 stock exchanges all around the world that collectively make up the entire stock market. But broadly speaking, especially here in America, when you're watching like CNBC or something and they're talking about the stock market is up or down, they're more than likely just talking about the US stock market, which includes exchanges like the NASDAQ or the New York Stock Exchange, right? And so that makes sense. But let's go ahead and break it down even more. So within the stock market, you've actually got what's known as stock market indexes. And indexes are simply just groups of stocks, bonds, and other investments that trade within the stock market. And we'll talk about what exactly indexes are for in a second. But overall, there are literally thousands of different indexes on the stock market. In fact, there's over 5,000 to be exact. But the most common indexes that you'll hear about are going to be like your Dow Jones, the S&P 500, the NASDAQ composite, right? These are like the three most popular uh, indexes that investors use to kind of track the overall stock market. And oftentimes when somebody's referring to the stock market, like for example, if your Uncle Bob says to you, uh, the stock market is down today, your Uncle Bob is probably referring to one of these stock market indexes, like the, the Dow Jones, the S&P 500, the NASDAQ composite. And that's because these indexes, specifically Dow Jones, the S&P 500, and the NASDAQ composite are designed to give you an overall view of the stock market. And so the next time you're hanging out with your uh, Uncle Bob and he's watching the news and they're saying that the S&P 500 is down 50 points today, you'll know exactly what it's referring to. And just as a really quick side note as well, uh, when, when the news says the market is up 50 points or it's down 100 points, points literally just is equal to uh, $1. So one point is $1. And so if Dow Jones is down 50 points, it just means that Dow Jones is down $50. One point equals $1. I don't know why they have to make it so complicated, but that's just for you to know for the future. Moving right along. So now you know what the stock market is. You know what stock market indexes are. Now let's talk about stock market sectors. We're going to drop down another level and get even more granular. So sectors are yet another way to break down the stock market and measure large groupings of stocks within the stock market. There are 11 broad sectors in total. Okay. You've got healthcare, materials, real estate, consumer staples, uh, consumer discretionary, utilities, energy, industrials, consumer services, financials, and technology. And so these are the 11 broad market sectors that stocks live within and that they get categorized into. And to break it down even more, within each of these sectors are actually subsectors and industries. Now, it's not really super important to go over the exact subsectors and the industries of each of these sectors. That would take far too long. 
but just understand that the reason sectors exist in the stock market in the first place is because not only is it a convenient way to sort of categorize different companies in the stock market, but sectors also make it much easier for investors to ensure that they have a well diversified portfolio. The stock market is obviously risky, right? And so one of the ways to help reduce that risk is by diversifying your portfolio with multiple stocks in multiple stock market sectors to ensure that you have broad exposure. Imagine that you're investing in stocks and you're only investing in stocks within the technology sector. So for example, companies like uh, Apple, Microsoft, Google, Tesla, these are all considered uh, technology stocks that live within the technology sector. Imagine that all of these stocks plummet, right? When these stocks plummet, your portfolio plummets as well because your portfolio is only investing in stocks within the technology sector. And so if the technology sector is doing bad, then your portfolio is gonna be performing poorly as well. However, if you're investing in five, six, seven, eight, nine, all of the all of the sectors, then now you're much more diversified. And so now when one sector plummets, like if the technology sector were to plummet, your entire portfolio is not tanking with that sector because your portfolio is diversified with stocks in multiple sectors or all of the sectors. Okay, so let's move on past stock market stuff now and talk about what exactly are stocks. You buy them on the stock market, you sell them, uh, sometimes they end up on Wall Street bets, your Uncle Bob knows a lot about them. So very simply put, um, stocks represent ownership in a company. For example, when you buy one share, that's two, one share of Apple, of Apple stock, you are literally buying one share of Apple Inc. located in Cupertino, California. Like you are literally buying a piece of the company. And this is exactly why stocks are called shares. You're buying one share of Apple stock. It's because that company, when you buy their stock, they are sharing ownership of their company with you. So that's easy enough, okay? That's what stocks are. But why exactly do companies issue stock? Because remember, when a company issues stock to investors like you and I, they're giving up part ownership of that company. Why would they not wanna retain 100% of the company and just keep all of the profits, all of the growth, everything for themselves? Why would they give up ownership to some other random stranger like you and I? So generally speaking, there are three different ways that companies uh, raise capital to continue growing and expanding their business, right? Because obviously you need money to grow a business. And so there's three different ways that companies do this. The first way is they can just simply use existing profits. You see this with a lot of growth stocks, and we'll talk about that later, what exactly that means. But growth stocks reinvest all of their profits back into their business. They don't give any dividends to shareholders. They don't do anything like that because they take all of their profits and they reinvest it back into expanding the business. Companies can also use debt to raise money, and so they can do this either by taking out a loan from the bank or they could issue bonds corporate bonds, right? When you buy corporate bonds from a company, you are essentially giving that company a loan and you're buying debt from them, which they promise to pay back to you with interest, okay? And so that's how you make money with bonds, but that's not the point of this video. That's just one of the ways that companies raise money. And then the last way, which is relevant to this video, is that companies can raise money by selling off ownership stakes in forms of shares to investors stocks. And so instead of a company getting into debt by selling bonds, they can just simply sell off tiny little pieces of their company to individual investors and raise money that way. So while we're on the topic of stocks, I want to talk about another very important topic, and that's how exactly are stocks categorized. So there are six different market caps that stocks are categorized in, and we'll, we'll talk about what exactly a market cap is in a second. But those six market caps are mega cap stocks, large cap, mid cap, uh, small cap, micro cap, and nano cap. Now, you probably noticed that every single one of those categories has the word cap in it. What exactly does cap mean? Well, cap is referring to the actual market capitalization of the stock. Every single stock that trades on the stock market has a market capitalization, which refers to the total value of a company's shares of stock. And every single stock is placed in one of these six categories based on the size of their market cap. And so as you can see on the screen, uh, mega cap stocks are companies with market caps of over $200 billion. These are some of the largest companies in the US, not some of, these are the largest companies in the US, right? And so these are your Amazons, Microsofts, Googles, Apple, right? These are all considered mega cap stocks. Uh, the lowest category of stocks are nano stocks. And these are stocks of companies that have market caps of $50 million or less. And I could name off some companies that are considered nano stocks, 
but I promise you, you likely wouldn't recognize the names of these companies, right? Because they're just that small and unknown. Now, there are two very important questions that come to mind when we're talking about the market capitalization of stocks. And that's how exactly is the market cap measured? Like, where does that number actually come from? Are we just pulling it out of a cereal box or are we doing some type of equation to get to that final figure? And the second question, which might be obvious, is why exactly is the market cap of a stock so important? Like, why should you care about the market cap if you're investing in the stock market? Okay, so let's start with the first question, which is how exactly is the market cap of a stock measured? It's a very simple formula, actually, and it's the current price of the stock multiplied by the total number of outstanding shares. So for example, let's say that you have a fictitious company called ABC Corp and that company is currently trading at $30 per share on the stock market. And then let's say that they have about 1 million outstanding shares. Well, the math there is very easy. You would just take $30, $30 which is the current price of the stock, uh, and multiply that by the outstanding shares, which is 1 million, and that gives you uh, 30 million. And so in this case, with ABC Corp, the company is valued at about 30 million based on its outstanding shares and based on the current price. However, forget the fake stuff. Let's take a look at a real life example. If you multiply the price of a stock, we'll use Apple as the example. If you multiply the price of the stock by the total outstanding shares, which if I go to Yahoo Finance, I can find that number right here. And so the outstanding shares of Apple stock is, uh, at the time of this recording, is 16.17 billion. So there are 16.17 billion shares of Apple stock that can be bought by investors. And so if I take the price, um, the current price per share of Apple at the time of this recording and multiply it by 16.17 billion, which is the outstanding shares, this gives us about 2.2 trillion dollars. This means Apple has a market cap of 2.2 trillion, which definitely makes Apple a mega cap stock. So that's how you figure out the market cap of a company. Um, alternatively, you could just technically go to Google and type in like Apple market cap, and it would probably just give you the answer right there on the spot. But I'm just saying, right? The next question I wanna ask you is, why exactly is the market cap important? Why should you, as a stock market investor, care about the market cap of a stock? So the market cap of a company is very important actually because it shows you the market's perception of the value of the stock and what investors are willing to pay for it. I'll say it again. The market cap shows you the market's perception of the stock and if it's actually worth its current price because it, and you'll know that because investors are either buying it and if they're buying it, the price is going up or investors are not buying it or perhaps they're selling it, which is pushing the price down. And so for the most part, the, the market's perception of a stock tends to be pretty accurate. Accurate. Let's just use Apple as the example of GIN, which has a market cap of over two trillion dollars. That's a pretty valuable company, it seems, right? Compare that to something like Burger King, which has a market cap of only $23 billion, which is nothing compared to Apple's two trillion dollars. And so my question to you is, is Apple actually worth two trillion dollars compared to Burger King's $23 billion? Is that a fair assessment of these two companies? Of course it is. I mean, that seems obvious, right? Apple creates some of the best products in the world and completely revolutionized an entire industry permanently. Meanwhile, you've got Burger King over here who's mass producing low quality dog food grade meat patties that they're trying to pass off as hamburgers. Now, there is one very important distinction that should be made about the market cap, right? Because as we're talking about the market cap, it almost kind of seems like we're saying that the market cap is what the company is worth. And that's not entirely true. But let's look at a real life example of a stock with GameStop, right? So back in January 2021, because of the elevated, the massively elevated level of hype around this stock, GameStop, because of the subreddit Wall Street Bets, GameStop went from a low of about $18 to a high of $325 in less than one month. And so I did the math on this, and this means that GameStop's market cap went from about $1.37 billion, which is really small for a company. Like if you think about Burger King, which is probably the, the worst fast food restaurant in existence, Burger King has a market cap of $23 billion, right? Okay. But compare that to GameStop's $1.37 billion, GameStop has a very small market cap. And so in less than one month, GameStop's market cap went from $1.37 billion to over $24.7 billion. That's a $23.3 billion uh, increase, market cap increase in less than one month. If you bought GameStop, which I hope you didn't, but if you bought GameStop at the high of $325, 
did you actually pay for what the stock was worth? Because technically it was $325, right? The market cap showed that it was it was valued at that price, but was it worth that much? Of course not. GameStop was never worth that much money. If you bought it at the top, you just overpaid by $300. So I hope that makes sense, right? Because it's very, very important to make a clear distinction that the market cap of a stock is a good relative measurement of what the stock is worth in the eyes of the public but it's not an absolute measurement. The next thing that we should talk about are the different types of stocks. So there are many different types of stocks that you can invest in, right? You've got value stocks, growth stocks, income stocks, blue chip stocks, uh, cyclical and non-cyclical stocks, defense stocks, IPO stocks, penny stocks, ESG stocks, and then of course you've got the difference between common stock and preferred stock. All of these terms are not super important to remember if I'm just being honest with you. Generally speaking, the types of stocks that you'll be investing in will fall into three categories, value stocks, uh, growth stocks and income stocks. These are going to be these are going to make up the bulk majority of your stocks. So let's go ahead and talk about what each of these three are, starting with growth stocks. Okay, and so growth stocks, as the name suggests, are stocks that are expected to grow at a faster rate compared to the general broad market. I'm going to show you a chart here on the screen. Okay, and so the blue line right there is Tesla. Uh, Tesla is considered a growth stock, right? And so the other two lines are the S&P 500 and Dow Jones, both indexes that represent the broad US stock market. As you can see, in terms of percentage growth over the past five years, Tesla has dominated compared to the broad market. This is what growth stocks are supposed to do. And I'm purposely putting that in air quotes because uh, growth stocks can also be very risky as well. And on that note, I'm gonna go ahead and add another growth stock on this chart, and that's Shopify. So Shopify was, or I don't know if they still are or not, considered a growth stock. But if you look at its performance over the last year, the stock is close to being down 80% on the year compared to the broad market, which is down roughly 10%, okay? And so while growth stocks definitely can elevate your portfolio to insane levels, like if you were to invest in Tesla, they can also be extremely risky and cause your portfolio to lose value very fast. And speaking of value, let's talk about value stocks. So value stocks are stocks that trade at prices below their perceived value. So these are stocks of companies that typically have very well ran, financially sound businesses that oftentimes have very good proven products and services, right? The problem is that the, the price of the stock has dropped because of some short term event. For example, the CEO becomes involved in some personal scandal, right? However, a smart investor knows that this drop in price does not reflect the true price of the stock. And so they jump in, they buy the stock while it's down, knowing that there's a good chance the public will eventually forget about the CEO scandal and the price of the stock will revert back to what it was previously. And we've actually seen this happen before in real life with stocks. I mean, think about, for example, Elon Musk when he was on the Joe Rogan podcast. If you know, you know. If you know what happened, then you know what happened, right? But you know, the, the, stock, the stock price responded to that event, right? Uh, investors got scared because they're like, what is he doing? And so the stock price reacted and it dropped a little bit. But eventually the stock price went back to its previous level and then went up from there. And then finally, you've got income stocks. And as the name suggests, these are stocks of companies that pay regular steady income typically in the form of dividends. Income stocks usually have a very high dividend yield that generates the majority of the stock's overall returns. A good example of this would be AT&T, right? So AT&T pays a 5.21% annual dividend, which is great. But if you're investing in AT&T for growth, as in you want to see the price of the stock go up and then you kind of get that capital appreciation, then you're not going to get that with AT&T. So I'm going to pull up the uh, AT&T chart right here so that you can see for yourself. Since the stock IPO'd back in the 80s, it's essentially stayed the same price. I mean, you had this pop right here back in the late 90s and early 2000s during the dot-com bubble, but back in 2002, which is over 20 years ago, uh, the stock was trading at about $20. And would you look at that, AT&T to this day is still trading at around $20 per share. And for the most part, this right here is what income stocks do because their focus is paying dividends to shareholders, right? They're not really focused on growth as much as they're focused on just keeping the investors happy, the shareholders happy. But with growth stocks, 
the focus of a growth stock is to reinvest all of the profits back into growing the business. And a perfect example of this would be Amazon. Amazon does not pay shareholders dividends because they prefer to reinvest all of their profits back into expanding Amazon even more. However, what ends up happening is because they're reinvesting all of the profits and the business is growing because they're expanding, what ends up happening is the stock price goes up. And if I pull up Amazon's uh, chart right here, you'll see on the screen, you'll see that over time, uh, Amazon stock price has gone up. And so even if investors aren't making money with dividends, they're still making money through the appreciation of the of their investment, right? If, if they bought Amazon down here back in 2015 and they held it this entire time, then obviously they're doing pretty well, right? Their investments have gone up in value significantly and that's how they make their money. Now, before we end part one of this video, I wanna quickly discuss with you the idea of risk and reward, right? Because we all know that the stock market is a risky place. But what exactly is risk? And is it something that can be avoided or at least limited? So generally speaking, risk equals reward. The more risk you take on, the more potential, hopefully, for a higher reward, okay? So if, let me just give you an example. Your savings account at your local bank is the safest kind of investment there is. But it also means that the reward is gonna be pretty much non-existent. The average savings rate for most savings accounts are like 0.01%. I mean, it's 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 literally nothing. You're getting paid pennies on the dollar if that. Compare that to something like real estate or the stock market or cryptocurrencies, which introduce a lot more risk, but the reward potential is far, far greater, okay? so. The question becomes, is it possible to avoid risk or at least mitigate it to a certain extent? And the answer is yes, it is definitely possible to mitigate risk. It's not possible to avoid risk if you actually want to get sizable returns that are big enough to actually help you to become wealthy. But you can help to mitigate some of the risk involved with investing. And there's three different ways that you can do this. The first way, which we'll talk about more in detail a little bit later, the first way is just by simply diversifying your portfolio. Instead of investing all of your money into one single stock where your entire portfolio is wrapped up in the performance of this one stock, if that one stock goes down to zero, then your entire portfolio also goes down to zero, right? So to avoid that risk, simply diversify your money across hundreds or even thousands of different stocks through the use of an ETF or index fund. We'll talk about those two things later. The other two ways that you can reduce risk is by dollar cost averaging into the stock market. Again, we'll talk a little bit more about that later, but essentially dollar cost averaging is just when you invest your money over a long period of time in small chunks, uh, instead of just investing in one big lump sum at the beginning of the year, you invest in smaller chunks throughout the year. And that helps to sort of spread out the risk a little bit more. And then the final way that you can kind of limit risk or sort of mitigate the risk is by um, having proper asset allocation, right? And so, for example, instead of having all of your investment portfolio being invested inside of the stock market, perhaps you have some of your investment portfolio being invested into real estate or into fine art or into cryptocurrencies, right? So it, asset allocation is basically just not having all of your eggs in one asset class. Okay, so moving on to part two of this video, let's talk about stock market investments. There are so many different types of investments that can be bought and sold on the stock market, and the vast number of investments can quickly become overwhelming and prevent you from starting in the first place. And so the best way to sort of break the ice to remove any fear involved with investing is to educate yourself, which is exactly what you're doing right now. And so you know what the stock market is, uh, you know what stocks are, are and why companies issue stocks, now I wanna talk about what exactly is an investment. And so really an investment is anything that you buy that you acquire with the goal of it either producing income or appreciating in value over time. And there are a lot of different types of investments out there. Like, you know, in this video, we're talking about stocks because we're talking about the stock market, but really stocks are just one small piece of the large pie. And all of these different types of investments can really be categorized into four different asset classes. Classes, right? So you've got uh, cash and cash equivalents, equities, fixed income, which can also just be called debt. And then finally, you've got alternative assets. And so starting out with cash and cash equivalents, uh, these are things like obviously money, cash, uh, money market funds, US treasury bills, CDs or certificates of deposits, your savings account is technically a type of investment. All of these are considered cash and cash equivalents. And then you've got equities, which is the one that most people are gonna be familiar with because this includes things like stocks, mutual funds, 
uh, index funds, ETFs, and some people will even put REITs or real estate investment trust into the equity asset class. And we'll talk about all of these in more detail in just a little bit. We'll go over the pros and cons of each of them and just kind of help to guide you on what you should be investing in within the stock market, okay? Next up, you've got fixed income investments or bonds. These are things obviously like bond ETFs or bond mutual funds, corporate bonds, government bonds, municipal bonds. Bonds are a type of debt that governments and corporations give out to raise money. And then the last asset class are alternative assets, right? This is stuff like real estate, cryptocurrencies, uh, precious metals, artwork, fine wine, collectibles, basically anything that doesn't fall into the three more traditional asset classes will be considered an alternative investment. And so those are the four types of asset classes that you can invest in. But as far as the stock market is concerned, okay, and investing in investments within the stock market, what options do you have? In other words, what are the most common stock market investments that you can start investing in to start building your wealth, okay? And we'll start out with the most obvious one, which is stocks. You already know what stocks are. You already know that they represent part ownership of a company, but let's really dive in deep here and break down what exactly the pros and cons are of stocks because knowing the pros and cons will help to guide your investment decisions. And so starting with the pros of stocks, the first pro, which is probably obvious, is that you can build massive wealth with stocks, okay? Investing in stocks is not like pulling the handle on a slot machine, right? Maybe you'll get lucky and hit the jackpot, but maybe you won't. When you invest in stocks or ETFs or index funds, which we'll talk about those later, as long as the US economy doesn't collapse into a million unfixable pieces, then your investments are likely gonna bear a lot of fruits in the future. The next pro is that you can start investing in stocks with very little money, right? It's not like investing in physical real estate, where you have to go to the bank and potentially put down tens of thousands of dollars just to get this one piece of real estate. With stocks, it's not like that, especially nowadays with most brokers offering fractional shares, you can basically start investing in companies like Amazon, Apple, Google. You can start investing in all these companies with as little as $1 thanks to fractional shares. The next pro is that stocks are relatively liquid investments. This means that if you had to, if there was an emergency and you had to quickly sell your stocks to, to regain access to your money, you could do it pretty quickly without your money losing too much value. Now, I'm using the word relatively liquid on purpose, okay? Because when you compare stocks to something like cash in your savings account, which is the most liquid type of investment out there, then stocks really aren't that liquid compared to cash in your savings account. But when you compare it to something like a physical piece of real estate, then yes, stocks are definitely way more liquid than that. And the last pro of investing in individual stocks is that you don't have to pay any management fees, right? When you're investing in something like a mutual fund, you have to pay a management fee in order to own shares in that mutual fund. But with individual stocks, stocks are just issued by companies. And so these companies are not charged charging you a management fee to own their stock because they're not managing anything. Okay, so moving on to the cons of investing in stocks. So for starters, the first con is that returns are never guaranteed. Just because the S&P 500 has given us a 10% return per year on average does not mean that it's gonna continue to do that every single year, year after year. The stock market will fluctuate. Some years the market may be in the negative, which means that your investment, your ROI, will also be in the negative, okay? The next con is that stocks are very hard to diversify. Buying individual stocks is not like buying, for example, an index fund, right? Where that index fund holds thousands of different stocks within one fund, when you buy individual stocks, you're only buying one company at a time. And so in order for you to have a healthy, diversified portfolio, if you're investing in individual stocks, well, that means that you're going to have to buy dozens of different stocks, which can be very time consuming because it means that you're gonna have to research all of these different stocks and put all this time into buying individual stocks instead of just buying something like an ETF, which holds hundreds of stocks at once. And because of this, because of what I just explained, another con of investing in stocks is that they require significantly more time and effort to maintain and monitor when you compare it to something like an ETF or an index fund, which basically is pretty passive. When you invest in individual stocks, and we'll go over all this stuff later, I'll teach you how to, how to research individual stocks. It's very time consuming, right? You have to look at things like the annual reports, the quarterly updates. You have to go through and analyze a ton of different data points to figure out what the best investments are gonna be. And doing that is very time consuming. It's why people like Warren Buffett do it as a full-time job, as a career, because it takes a lot of time, a lot of effort, a lot of practice 
to do it right. Next up, ETFs or exchange traded funds. Now ETFs are my personal favorite way of investing in the stock market, okay? Very simply put, an ETF is a basket of hundreds and even sometimes thousands of individual stocks all tied up in one single ETF. They are incredible investments and they're a really great way for anybody to start investing in the stock market. So let's go ahead and go over the pros and cons of ETF, starting with the first pro, which is that ETFs provide your portfolio with really great diversification. As I just mentioned, one single share of one ETF can hold up to thousands of individual stocks, right? And so if you were to go and buy, for example, uh, the Vanguard Total Stock Market ETF or VTI, this one ETF holds over 4,100 stocks. And so when you buy the ETF, you're essentially investing in 4,000 plus different stocks all by investing in one single ETF. Another great thing about ETFs is that they trade on the stock market exactly like stocks. And this is good for a number of reasons. The obvious reason is for liquidity, right? As long as the stock market is open, you can log into your brokerage account at any point and buy and sell shares of an ETF. Next, ETFs, although they do charge a fee, will typically charge significantly lower fees compared to other investment funds, such as mutual funds. Okay, so what about some of the cons of investing in ETFs? Well. For starters, while ETFs can definitely provide your portfolio with diversification, they can also at the same exact time cause your portfolio to not be diversified. Let me explain how that's even possible. So some ETFs will focus on investing in stocks in certain sectors, industries, and indexes that might limit your exposure to other types of stocks. Let me give you an example of this. So an ETF like VOO or the Vanguard S&P 500 ETF only focuses on investing in stocks within the S&P 500 index. And the S&P 500 index focuses heavily on large cap stocks. And because of this, if you're only investing in that Vanguard ETF, which focuses on the S&P 500, then you could be leaving out potential opportunities from mid and small cap stocks, which oftentimes present a lot of growth potential. Another con of ETFs is that they tend to have smaller dividend yields compared to individual dividend stocks. If you were to, for example, look at a really popular dividend ETF such as SCHD, which is an ETF that focuses only on investing in the best dividend stocks, well, this ETF only has a dividend yield of 2.83%. Compare that to a dividend stock like AT&T, which pays an annual dividend nearly double that at 5.21%. Now, of course, if you're only investing in AT&T, then you're not getting the same diversification that you would get by investing in a dividend ETF like SCHD, but you get the point. The best dividend ETFs tend to not pay higher dividends than the best dividend stocks. Overall though, for those of you who have been watching my videos for a while now, you'll know that ETFs are my personal favorite way of investing in the stock market. And honestly, it's what I would recommend most investors out there do. And just as a really quick side note, if you wanna learn more about investing in ETFs and how to get started with that, I've got a video specifically about ETF investing. I'll link that down in the description below and you can watch that video after you finish watching this video, of course. Next up are mutual funds. So mutual funds are professionally managed investment funds that pool money from investors to purchase stocks and other securities. But Anyways, pros and cons of mutual funds. So starting with the pros, the first pro is that mutual funds have advanced portfolio management. When you buy a mutual fund, you'll typically have to pay a higher management fee, which is used to hire a professional portfolio manager or a team of humans who buy and sell investments on a day-to-day -day basis. Once again, very similar to ETFs, because mutual funds are a type of fund, they can also be pretty diversified investments holding anywhere from a few hundred to a few thousand different stocks at once. Okay, so now it's time for the cons. And the first major con or downside of mutual funds is that they have very high fees. And even worse, sometimes they charge multiple fees depending on the mutual fund, and oftentimes these fees are hidden, and so you don't even know they exist. And this can really eat into your investment returns. These additional fees include things like sales load fee, redemption fee, exchange fee, account fee, purchase fee, management fee, distribution fee, total annual fund operating expenses. I mean, you're literally paying for as much as the mutual fund can get away with, right? And because mutual funds are actively managed, meaning that real humans are in an office making day-to-day -day decisions, you're also paying for the mutual fund's salaries, right? Because they have people working in their offices. You're paying for office supplies, 
I would even go as far as to say you're probably paying for lunches, like like office lunches. And so another major con of mutual funds is something called management abuse. Once again, because mutual funds are actively managed, it's possible for the manager of the fund or really anybody on the team to excessively make trades, lie about the assets that the mutual fund holds, and do things like window dressing. Window dressing in a mutual fund is a very dishonest practice that many mutual funds take part in, where in order to improve the appearance of the fund's performance, the fund manager will sell stocks that have large losses and purchase better performing stocks near the end of the quarter or the end of the year so that they can report the good in the book and leave out the bad, right? And so window dressing gives off the appearance that the mutual fund has better returns, which is not true. Additionally, mutual funds are not liquid investments. That's because unlike stocks and ETFs, which can be traded at any time throughout the day, uh, mutual funds only execute trades once per day at the end of the day at 4 p.m. Eastern. This is also called the closing net asset value or the NAV, whatever the NAV is at the end of the day is the price that you'll get filled at. Now, the reason this is a problem is because imagine a scenario where the market is crashing. And so you decide that you wanted to log into your brokerage account and try and sell some of your investments before you lost too much money. Well, unfortunately, if you own a mutual fund, you wouldn't be able to sell your investments. Now, you could certainly initiate a trade to sell your investments, but your investments wouldn't actually sell until the very end of the day. Next up, we've got index funds. So index funds are actually a type of mutual mutual fund that track the performance of a specific market index. If you recall from earlier in the video, we talked about indexes and indexes are basically just benchmarks that measure a large group of stocks such as the S&P 500 or Dow Jones. And so index funds are mutual funds that track these indexes, okay? However, unlike your traditional mutual funds that tend to have very high management fees, most mutual funds are very similar to ETFs in that they don't charge high fees. And that's because most index funds are passively managed, meaning that they seek to replicate the performance of their benchmarks instead of trying to outperform them. And so an index that tracks the S&P 500, for example, simply tries to replicate the performance of the S&P 500. For this reason, index funds don't need to be actively managed by a fund manager or a team of people. And because of that, they tend to be a lot cheaper. And yet again, because index funds are a type of investment fund, they typically invest in thousands of different stocks at once, which makes them great for diversification. Okay, moving on to the cons. So the first con of index funds is that you don't have any control over the underlying assets. If you buy, for example, an index fund that invests in the S&P 500, you have no choice but to include all the stocks within the S&P 500 within your portfolio. Another small con is that with index funds, you can't beat the market because the index fund is designed to track the market. Let's use the S&P 500 as an example again, right? If you're investing in an S&P 500 index fund, that index fund is specifically designed to track the S&P 500 as closely as possible. And because of this, you'll never be able to have returns that beat that index. Now, I do want to add, though, that in most cases, the broad market returns actually end up beating the returns of actively managed funds that attempt to beat the market, which means you're actually better off just investing in an ETF or index fund that tracks a specific index, such as the S&P 500. And the final con of index funds is that they lack strategies such as investing in specific sectors or investing for dividends. Unlike ETFs, which can track any stock market sector, industry, index, or even specific investment strategies, index funds only track indexes. And finally, let's talk about REITs, okay? So a REIT or real estate investment trust is a company that owns and in most cases operates income producing real estate. I personally like to think of a REIT as an ETF that only invests in physical real estate. So what are some of the pros of REITs? Okay, so for starters, if you've ever wanted to invest in real estate but you don't have enough money because it can get pretty expensive, REITs give you the opportunity to buy real estate without needing tens of thousands of dollars. REITs also tend to pay some pretty high dividend yields and that's because by law, REITs are required to pay out 90% of its taxable income to investors in the form of dividends. And so this is obviously good news for your wallet, right? In addition to that, REITs also have good liquidity since they can also be bought and sold on the stock market just like stocks. But what about cons? So the first con of REITs is that the dividends that they pay out are taxed as regular income. Now we'll get into taxes in detail um, a little bit later on in this video, but usually dividends are taxed at the same tax rate as long-term capital gains, which is anywhere from zero to 20%, depending on your ordinary 
every income tax bracket. Another potentially bad thing about REITs, and this really goes for any investment, I guess, but um, trends can influence them. For example, let's say that you invested in a REIT that had a portfolio full of, I don't know, malls. Well, as malls begin to decrease in popularity, that REIT will take a hit. Earlier, we talked about uh, ETFs index funds and mutual funds. And one thing that kept coming up were the words passively managed and actively managed. And so what I wanna do now is talk about the difference between these two different types of funds. And we'll start first with actively managed funds. So an actively managed fund is a type of investment fund, be it an ETF, an index fund, uh, a mutual fund that is literally actively managed. This means that there is a fund manager and potentially a team of Ivy League graduates working in the fund, analyzing, buying, and selling investments on a day-to-day -day basis. The goal with actively managed funds is to attempt to beat the market returns, right? So an example of an actively managed fund would be any of Kathy Wood's uh, ARK ETFs. Kathy Wood is the fund manager in what I would assume to be all of her different ARK ETF uh, funds. And she probably has a team of people that work with her inside of those funds. Now, because of this, because of all the work that goes into managing these funds, they're almost always gonna have much higher fees because there's more overhead. And to make matters even worse, actively managed funds hardly ever consistently beat the broad market returns. Over the long term, you'll make more money by investing into a broad market index fund or ETF, such as an S&P 500 ETF, than you will by investing in, for example, an ARK ETF, which is actively managed and attempts to beat the market. Now, something else that's worth noting is that actively managed funds tend to be taxed pretty heavily, which of course diminishes the fund's performance. You see, every single time the fund sells holdings, the fund will incur taxes and fees, which they then pass along to the investors. And because actively managed funds are selling holdings every single day, this starts to add up really fast. Now, the other type of investment fund is a passively managed fund. These do not have fund managers or people working for them within the fund because they simply follow a market index or some type of benchmark. And so let's take SCHD or the Schwab US Dividend Equity ETF as an example. So this is a passively managed dividend ETF that's goal is to track the total return of the Dow Jones US Dividend 100 Index. And this index was specifically designed to measure the performance of high dividend yield stocks within the US. And it does this not by hiring expensive Ivy League fund managers, but instead through the use of very smart computers and advanced algorithms. And because of this, because passively managed funds do not use humans to manage the fund, they're almost always cheaper to own because there's virtually no overhead. They're also significantly more tax efficient because unlike actively managed funds, which buy and sell investments almost on a daily basis, passively managed funds are not buying and selling every day. Moving next to part number three, in the video, which is how to actually invest in the stock market. And this is where the fun actually begins. But before you begin investing in the stock market, there are gonna be a few prerequisites that you need, including a brokerage account and some type of investment strategy. Let's talk about both really quick, starting with a brokerage account, okay? So very simply put, a brokerage account is a type of investment account that lets you buy and sell different types of investments, such as stocks, bonds, ETFs, mutual funds, etc. And so you need a brokerage account before you can actually begin investing in the stock market, right? This is not something that you can do buying and selling stocks is, is not something that you can do inside of your bank account, for example. And there are actually a few different types of brokerage accounts out there that you'll want to kind of learn about. The first type of brokerage account is the individual investment account. This is your standard taxable brokerage account that can be opened up at any broker. And there are two different accounts within this one. You've got cash accounts and margin accounts. Okay. So cash accounts are probably the most common. It's a very simple account. You put cash in and the cash that you put in can be invested. Okay. That's it. It's very easy, simple, straight to the point. And then you've got margin accounts. Okay. So margin accounts will present a significant amount of risk to your investing. Basically the way margin accounts work is that you borrow money to make investments, right? Sometimes up to six times your account value. Let's say for example, that you deposited $1,000 into your brokerage account. Well, if you had a margin account and that margin account gave you, let's just say six times leverage, this means that your buying power wouldn't just be $1,000. It would be 1,000 times six times leverage, which means your actual buying power would be $6,000, even though you still technically only have 
$1,000 in the account. You'll oftentimes see stock market day traders using uh, margin accounts to increase their trading size, but margin is extremely risky. You may have heard the term margin call before, right? This is when your broker demands that you deposit more money into your account to cover possible losses because you took on too much risk using margin. I mean, people literally lose entire life savings and can get into some pretty big trouble by using margin. So it's not something that I would recommend the vast majority of investors do, especially if you're just investing for the long term and you're not doing something like day trading. The next type of brokerage account that you can open up is a joint account. These are basically the same as individual investment accounts, except joint accounts uh, are shared with somebody else, right? A significant other, a partner, somebody else. There really are no benefits to using one of these accounts compared to a individual investment account, aside from the fact that you might be simplifying your investment management or your estate planning or perhaps saving a little bit of money on fees. Next up are retirement accounts. So retirement investment accounts, also known as IRAs or individual retirement accounts, are a type of investment account that allow you to save money for retirement with tax-free growth or on a tax-deferred basis. Let's go ahead and go through all the different types of retirement accounts that are available to you, and then I'll explain the difference between tax-free growth and tax-deferred growth as we go through each account. So one of the most common types of retirement investment accounts that you'll hear about is the Roth IRA, and the Roth IRA offers tax-free growth. The Roth IRA is a very powerful retirement account that lets you invest taxed income into the stock market and have that money grow completely tax-free. Let's just say, for example, that over the next 30 years, you start investing $500 per month into your Roth IRA, and that account grows to $1 million plus. Well, because you earn this money inside of the Roth IRA, Uncle Sam and his paperclip counting friends at the IRS won't be able to touch that money. And that's because the money that you deposit into the Roth IRA has already been taxed. It's tax income, which means that Uncle Sam already got his cut. Now, the only downside to the Roth IRA is that it has some pretty small investment limits, okay? So if you're under the age of 50, then you can only contribute up to $6,000 per year into your Roth IRA. If you're over the age of 50, you can contribute only $7,000 per year from your, your post-tax income into the Roth IRA. The Roth IRA also has some income limits. If you make too much money, then you're not allowed to invest inside of the Roth IRA. However, there are loopholes, ways that you can get around this with like a backdoor Roth IRA so that you can still take advantage of the tax-free growth offered with the Roth IRA. Another very common investment account is the 401k, and 401ks offer tax-deferred growth. Tax-deferred Deferred growth means that the growth of your investments are not taxed until you start making withdrawals from your investment account. This is different, of course, from the Roth IRA, where all of your investment gains are not taxed when you start making withdrawals, but all of the money that you put into the account is taxed. With the 401k, it's the exact opposite. All of the money that you put into the account can be used as a write-off on your income, and so it's not taxed, but then all of the money that you take out of that account during retirement will be taxed as ordinary income. Also, it's worth mentioning that the 401k is a employee sponsored retirement plan, okay? This means that if you do not work for somebody for an employer who offers 401k benefits, then you can't use one, unfortunately. However, the good news though is that you still do have options. And that's because in addition to the Roth IRA and 401k, there are several other different types of retirement accounts that you can open. And then lastly, the final sort of category of brokerage account types is the custodial account. Custodial accounts are simply investment accounts for kids under the age of 18. Essentially, all the same accounts that are available to you as an adult are also available to children under the age of 18 through the use of a custodial account. Now, of all of these different accounts, and there's a lot of them, which do I recommend that you open? Well, first things first, I recommend that every single person watching every single person watching should have a Roth IRA account. There is literally no better way to invest your money in the stock market and, and earn tax-free growth than a Roth IRA. It's the only account that lets your money grow and not be taxed. Additionally, if your employer offers 401ks and even better, if they offer 401k matching, then you definitely wanna take full advantage of this because the matching is literally free money. Also, it's worth mentioning that if you already have a 401k, you can also open up a Roth IRA in addition to the 401 you, you can have both types of accounts at the same time. And if you're in a situation where either your employer doesn't offer 401ks or perhaps you're self-employed, then there are still a lot of other great options such as the solo 401k and the SEP IRA. Okay, so now I'd like to take a second to talk about the best investing apps that you can use to begin investing starting today. So I divided the brokers into two separate parts representing the bulk of my audience here on YouTube, right? So on the left are US brokers and then on the right are international brokers. And so 
the best US investing apps, in my opinion, in no specific order, are Fidelity, Vanguard, Webull, M1 Finance, Public, and Wealthfront. Also, don't forget with uh, Webull, if you open up an account today and deposit just one penny, you'll get six free stocks worth up to $12,600 with a minimum $34 guaranteed just for depositing one penny. So make sure you do that if you're interested in getting some free stocks. And then on the right, you've got the best international investing accounts, which include eToro, Interactive Brokers, Trading212, DeGiro, and Capital.com. Now, while we're on the subject of brokers and investing apps, I wanna quickly talk to you about the application process of setting up a brokerage account. And just keep in mind that for the most part, the process of applying and opening up a new brokerage account is gonna be the same no matter what investing app you use, okay? And so typically the first part of the application process for any broker will be completing the application, right? And so I went ahead and put up an example application from Fidelity on the screen, but basically it's just gonna ask you details about yourself, such as your name, social security number, date of birth, your country of citizenship, address, things like that, right? Next, the broker will likely have you set up a new account with a username and password, um, and they'll have you verify your identity, and they typically do this by having you submit your driver's license to them in, in the form of a picture, right? And if you don't have a driver's license, then really any valid form of identification will do. And then after that, you just wait for the application to be approved. Um, again, this shouldn't really take too long. From my experience, it typically happens within minutes, but the longest it could take is up to 48 hours. And then after that, you fund your account by connecting your bank to your brokerage account, and then you start investing. I mean, it really is that simple. It's about a four to five step process, but the whole process takes less than like an hour to complete or or perhaps a couple of days if they have to do additional verification. So now that you've selected your broker, it's time to talk about the five different investment strategies. These five strategies are not by any means the only five investment strategies that you can use to invest. However, they are the five most popular and just commonly used strategies for investing in the stock market and building wealth. So the five that I wanna to talk to you about today are the following. Uh, value investing, growth investing, income investing, buy and hold and dollar cost averaging. Now, before we get into each of these five investment strategies, I wanna first discuss with you the importance of having an investment strategy in the first place. It's like the old saying goes, if you don't plan, then you plan to fail. And so you have to create a plan for yourself and deciding on a type of investment strategy is just like having a plan. It's gonna to help to guide and direct your investing decisions and keep you focused on the end goal. And so with that being said, let's go ahead and briefly go over each of these five investment strategies so that you can get a good idea of which one you might wanna pick for your investing journey. And we'll start first with value investing. So if you recall from earlier, one of the stock types that we discussed was value stocks, right? These are stocks from companies that appear to trade at a lower price relative to the stock's fundamentals. And so with the value investing strategy, you are only focused on buying stocks that you think are value stocks. Next, you've got growth investing. And to no surprise, this investment strategy focuses on investing in growth stocks. Again, we talked about this earlier, but growth stocks are companies whose earnings are expected to increase at an above average rate compared to their industry sector or the overall market. Growth investors make money through through capital appreciation. And there's also many ETFs that only focus on growth investing, such as the Vanguard Growth ETF or the Investco Triple Q's Trust Series 1 ETF. Next, you've got income investing. This can also just be called dividend investing. Income or dividend investing is when you focus on buying stocks from companies that pay out an above average dividend. And again, there are ETFs designed specifically to follow this type of investment strategy, right? So like you've got, for example, the um, SCHD or the Schwab US dividend an equity ETF, which is one that I really like. You've also got VYM or the Vanguard High Dividend Yield ETF. Next up is the buy and hold strategy. Buy and hold simply means that you are buying investments with the intention of holding on to those investments for a very long time. Regardless of what's happening in the stock market with fluctuations and volatility, you continue holding for a long time because you are a long-term investor. In the end, after holding for so many years, your investments will have increased significantly in value. And so not only are you making money from the price appreciation, but you'll also have built your portfolio through compounding interest. And then finally, there's the dollar cost averaging strategy, which is my personal favorite. So the term dollar cost averaging was actually originally coined by Warren Buffett's mentor, 
Benjamin Graham in his book, The Intelligent Investor. And he says that dollar cost averaging simply means that the investor invests in stocks the same number of dollars each month over a long period of time. In this way, the investor buys more shares when the market is low compared to when it's high. And the investor will likely end up with a satisfactory overall price for all of their holdings. So in short, when you apply dollar cost averaging to your investing, you invest a fixed amount of money into the stock market every single month, regardless of how high or how low the stock market is. A common practice if you're investing in a Roth IRA, for example, is to invest $500 per month every single month for 12 months every single year. This means that you'll end up investing $6,000 per year, which is the maximum contribution limit. And just as a really quick side note, you don't have to just pick one of these investment strategies. Like if you see more than one that you think could be applicable to what your long-term goals are, then you can do that. I mean, I personally utilize four of these investment strategies in my investing. And so you don't have to just be limited to one, okay? I wanna talk about how exactly do you make money in the stock market, right? There are two really broad ways that you can make money in the stock market. The first way is through appreciation. Okay, when you buy a stock and then the price of that stock goes up after you buy it, that's called appreciation. The value of your investment has appreciated. It's gone up in value, which means that if you sell it, then you stand to earn a profit. The next way to make money in the stock market is through dividends, right? Companies will often pay dividends to its shareholders if it has excess profits and wants to reward investors for holding on to their stock. Oftentimes, investors who are looking to make money in the stock market through dividends will invest specifically in income stocks, which if you recall from earlier, are stocks from companies that pay higher than normal dividends. Moving on, to part three of this video, I want to discuss with you guys how to find winning stocks. If you're looking for one secret, one ultimate trick that will tell you whether a stock is a winner or not, I'm here to tell you it doesn't exist. Researching stocks requires a significant amount of time and experience gathering information and analyzing specific data points to figure out if a stock meets your needs. And so in this part of the video, I'm gonna show you exactly what data points you should focus on to get the best results. So essentially what we're doing here is called fundamental analysis. We wanna look at things like the company's revenue, profitability, assets and liabilities, growth potential, and use all of these metrics, these data points, to give us a better picture of the stock. Now, before we actually get into all of the important metrics that you should look at when researching stocks, I wanna quickly bring your attention to this website here, finviz.com. It's a free website that we'll be using to reference certain data points as we go through this part of the video. Okay, so let's start off talking about something called the PE ratio or the price to earnings ratio. This is a number that measures the company's current stock price against its EPS or earnings per share to try and get an idea of what the value of the stock is. And so basically with the PE ratio, you're trying to find whether or not the stock is overvalued or undervalued because the goal ideally is that you try to invest in stocks that are undervalued valued, right? Because if they're undervalued, it means they have a lot more room to grow. And so how exactly can we use the PE ratio to know if a stock is overvalued or undervalued? Generally speaking, and this is very general, a higher PE ratio means the stock is overvalued and a lower PE ratio means the stock is undervalued. Now the market average PE ratio currently sits between a 20 and 25. And so if a stock has a PE ratio of higher than 25, we can kind of assume or consider that the stock is overvalued. And with that same logic, if a stock has a PE ratio below 20, it could be considered good or undervalued. So just to give you an example here, okay? Apple currently has a PE ratio of 23.01, according to Finviz, right? If we're basing whether or not the stock is overvalued or undervalued based on the market average of between 20 and 25, then we can assume that Apple's PE ratio of 23.01 is perfectly balanced. Apple is worth exactly how much it should be worth. It's not overvalued or undervalued. But again, this is extremely general and it is not a definitive way to know if a stock is a good pick or a bad pick. It's just one tool in the toolbox. Another very commonly used metric is the PEG ratio or the price to earnings to growth ratio. This ratio lets you compare the price of a stock compared to the company's underlying earnings and growth. Generally speaking, a PEG ratio over one means that the company is overvalued and a PEG ratio below one means that the company is undervalued. And so if we go to Finviz and I'm gonna use Apple as our example again, Apple has a PEG ratio of 2.32. Whoa. That's pretty high, Joshua. If over one is considered high and Apple has a peg ratio of 2.32, 
is it not worth buying? And hold on a second, I thought that earlier Apple's PE ratio was 23.01, which meant that the stock was priced perfectly. What, what's happening here, Joshua? Well, just like the PE ratio, the peg ratio is by no means like an end-all be-all for determining if a stock is a good buy or bad buy. Again, it's just another tool in the entire toolkit. Ideally, what you would wanna do is use all the tools to make a more educated guess based on your entire toolkit. And so let's keep on looking at some other metrics and other tools that you can use to analyze stocks. Next, let's talk about the PB ratio or the price to book ratio. The PB ratio compares the cost of the stock to the value of the company if that company were to be sold today. Typically, a PB ratio of one is preferred by investors who are looking to find a stock that has growth potential because a PB ratio under one is an indicator that the stock may be potentially undervalued. And once again, you can find the PB ratio as well as all the ratios that we're going over on Finviz. The next data point that you can look at on top of all the others that we've already talked about is the return on assets or the ROA. So the ROA ratio is a ratio that indicates how profitable a company is in relation to all of its assets. This ratio helps you to judge how efficient the company's management is at using the company's assets to generate income. In general, the higher the ROA, the more efficient the company is at generating profits. Typically, an ROA above five is considered good and an ROA above 20 is considered great. And so for example, if I go to Finviz and go to Apple, Apple has an ROA of almost 29%, which is really good. But because no single measurement or ratio can give you the entire picture of a company's health, yet again, we must add more tools to the toolkit. And next we'll talk about the ROE, and ROE is the return on equity. Now, very similar to ROA, ROE is a measurement that gauges a company's profitability and how efficient it is at generating profits. The higher the ROE, the better, because it means that the company is more efficient at generating income and producing profits. And just for reference, Apple has a ROE of a whopping 153%. Typically anything between 15 and 20% ROE is considered good. And just as a really quick note, you guys, it's worth mentioning that all these measurements and ratios should really usually only be compared to other stocks in the same sector or industry. For example, you wouldn't really compare Apple to say a utility company right, because they're in two completely different sectors. And what might be considered good ratios in one sector may not be considered good in the other, okay? And so just kind of keep that in mind when you're comparing stocks. Now, there are some other metrics that we could go over to help you analyze stocks, but what you'll sort of find is that you start getting into really nuanced metrics and details that, yes, they might help a tiny, tiny bit, but in the grand scheme of things, they don't really do that much for you. For example, the quick ratio is another ratio that you can look at in addition to all the others that we've already talked about. The quick ratio measures a company's capacity to pay its current liabilities without having to sell any of the assets or obtain additional financing. Typically, a one-to-one -one ratio is considered good because it means that for every liability that you have, you have just as much of a liquid asset to cover that liability if you needed to. And again, I'm really sorry if I'm starting to kind of sound like a broken record, I just can't help but repeat this enough, okay? You cannot look at any single one of these ratios or measurements as an absolute definitive picture of the overall health of a business. In fact, in addition to all of these ratios and measurements, you'll also wanna do research on things outside of the company's financials. For example, you'll wanna look at things like the leadership, right? The culture of the company. Does the company prioritize ESG or not? Does the company have a competitive product or service with longevity? These are all factors that you'll wanna look at before making any investment decisions on any individual stocks. And this is where researching stocks can start to get extremely time consuming and tricky. And it's the reason why I always recommend regular investors, people like you and I, instead of investing in individual stocks and using our time to research and do all that stuff, Instead, just invest in ETFs or index funds. When you invest your money into an ETF or into an index fund, you're leaving the stock picking up to the Warren Buffetts of the world. And I don't know about you, but if I had to choose between myself picking stocks for myself or Warren Buffett picking stocks for me, I'm going with my man Buffett every single day. Okay, so let's transition now into part number four, which is actually buying our first stock. And in this example, I'm gonna be using Webull. I really like Webull. It's a great investing app with a ton of features. And so here I am in my Webull Play account. That's right, I said Play account. I use this account to make speculative investments and it's kind of just like play money for me. But anyways, the stock market's open right now and I'm gonna go into Webull and buy a share of Apple stock live. And while we're in here buying the share of Apple stock, I'm gonna use it as an opportunity to show you all the different order types that you can use when buying and selling stocks. So let's go ahead and type in Apple and pull it up here. 
here we are. And so from here, you'll notice that we've got the stock chart with the candlesticks. But what you're gonna focus on is right here where it says buy and sell. And Webull makes it very straightforward. If you wanna buy the stock, click on buy. If you wanna sell the stock, click on sell. It's very straightforward. However, I wanna bring your attention to this drop down right here that says order type. And this is what I wanna talk with you about. As you can see from this list here, there are several different order types that you can use to buy and sell stocks. And so starting at the top of the list, we've got the limit order. So a limit order is used when you buy or sell a stock at a specific price. And so let's just say, for example, that I only wanted to buy Apple at 140. I don't wanna pay the current price of 143 or whatever the stock is currently trading at. I want it a little bit cheaper and I'm willing to wait for the price to drop to 140 if it ever does to get that price that I want, okay? And so I'm simply gonna set the limit price to 140, enter the number of shares that I wanna buy, which is one, and then hit buy. And then from this point, it's just a waiting game because I have to wait for the price of Apple to drop down to 140 before it fills my order at 140. And my limit order remains open for as long as I want it to, okay? And so do you see this right here where it says time in force? If I click that drop down, there's two options. The first option is day, and then there's another option that says good till cancel, okay? If I want to set a limit order, and have it stay there for ever until I get filled, I'm gonna set the time in force to good till cancel. If I wanna set a limit order, but I say to myself, if I don't get filled today, then I want the order to cancel itself automatically. Then I'm gonna set the time in force to day. However, let's just say for example that you wanted to quickly buy and sell a stock. You don't wanna set a limit price and wait for the price to reach your limit price before you're filled. You want the stock now. In this case, you would use a market order. So a market order is an order to buy or sell a stock at the market's current best price. And so if you look right here at the level two, uh, you'll see that there's two sides, a bid and an ask. If I submit a market order to buy a share of Apple stock, I'll be filled at whatever the top ask price is. And then on the contrary, if I wanna sell my Apple stock and I wanna do a market sell order, I'm gonna be filled at the bid at whatever the top bid price is, okay? Now, if you're using Webull and you're like, Joshua, I don't have level two on my app you probably have level one because you have to pay for level two. I think it's like $2 per month, but level one works perfectly fine because the level one is still gonna show you the top bid price and the top ask price. And that's all you need in order to submit a market order. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna submit a market order to buy one share of Apple because I wanna be filled as quickly as possible. And so I just want one share and then I'm gonna tap on buy and then it'll ask me to confirm. I hit confirm. And just like that, I'm officially a part owner in Apple. Easy enough, right? So let's just say, for example, that you wanted to sell a stock. Simply click on sell. Make sure that the order type is set to market if that's what you wanna use. And then the amount of shares is one. And then hit sell. Confirm that you wanna sell it. And just like that, you are no longer a part owner in Apple. Easy enough, right? So again, links down below for Webull if you wanna sign up for Webull to get those free stocks worth up to $12,600. Let's move on now to part six of the video and now it's time to talk about probably the least exciting but the most important part of investing and that is taxes. So this is one thing that cannot be avoided because Uncle Sam and his really good friends at the IRS have the nose of a bloodhound when it comes to you and your taxes, okay? And so if you attempt to hide your investment gains, believe me, they will figure out eventually that you're hiding it and they will come and get it from you. So for starters, it is very important that you understand the difference between short-term capital gains and long-term capital gains, okay? Depending on which category your investment gains fall into could mean that you end up paying a lot of taxes or potentially even zero taxes, okay? So listen very closely and pay attention. So short-term capital gains are profits that you make from selling assets that you've held for less than one year. Short-term capital gains are taxed at the same rate as your regular income, anywhere from 10 to 37%. On the other hand, long-term capital gains are profits that you make from selling assets that you've held for longer than one year. The long-term capital gains tax rates are 0%, 15% and 20% depending on your income tax bracket, okay? So this is a significantly lower tax rate than being taxed on a short-term uh, basis, which would be taxed as your ordinary income. Now that you understand the two different types of investments, how exactly does it tie in to how you'll be taxed on your investments? So when we're talking about taxes on investments, there are two different types of uh, investment income that the IRS will tax you on capital gains and dividends. Capital gain is the profit from the sale of an asset, okay? Very easy. If you go in, you buy one share of XYZ stock for $10, but then the next day XYZ stock goes up to $20, 
and you sell it, well, you now have a capital gain of $10, a $10 profit, and the IRS wants a piece of that. Now, because you earned a capital gain under one year, because you bought XYZ stock one day and then sold it the very next day, the IRS is gonna tax you on that capital gain as ordinary income. And so, for example, let's just say that you fall into the 22% uh, marginal rate tax bracket, right? This means that at the time of this recording, you earn between $41,000 and $89,000 per year, which means you're being taxed at about a 22% rate, okay? And because that's your regular income tax bracket, that $10 capital gain that you earn from the sale of XYZ stock is going to be taxed at a 22% rate, which is the exact same as your regular income. Does that make sense? But here's the secret that the IRS doesn't want you to know, okay? If you wanted to be taxed less or potentially not taxed at all, you would simply need to buy XYZ stock and then hold on to it for one year or more before selling it for a profit. And so if you bought XYZ stock at $10, and instead of selling it the next day, you waited one year and then sold it for a profit, your investment return would go from being taxed as a short-term capital gain to a long-term capital gain because you held on to the stock for more than a year. And long-term capital gains are taxed much differently from short-term capital gains. So as you can see right here from the chart, um, there are three different brackets that you can fall into, 0%, 15% and 20%. Let's just say, for example, that you earned $37,000 per year, okay? Well, if you look at the chart here, what you'll notice is that if you're a single filer, and you earn between $0 and $41,000 per year, that if you earn a long-term capital gain, you're gonna be taxed at a 0% rate. That's right, you heard that correctly. You're not gonna have to pay any taxes on your capital gains if you fall into that, uh, that income bracket, okay? And this is exactly why oftentimes you'll hear stories about the wealthy paying lower taxes than the working class, right? It's because a lot of their money is coming from these capital gains, which are taxed at drastically lower rates than regular income. Now let's talk about taxes on dividends, okay? Because taxes on dividends are kind of similar, but they're still different. With dividends, there are two different types of dividends that companies pay to investors, and both are taxed differently, okay? So the first type of dividend is called a qualified dividend, and then the other type is an ordinary dividend. Qualified dividends are taxed the same way that long-term capital gains are taxed, okay? Between zero and 20% depending on your income. On the other hand, just as the name suggests, ordinary dividends are taxed as ordinary income. Now, how exactly can you tell if a stock or ETF pays qualified dividends versus ordinary dividends? Well, aside from searching for it on Google, your broker will specify on the 1099 div that they send you during tax season whether or not the dividends are qualified or or ordinary. Now, just really quickly, another way that you can reduce your tax burden is with capital losses, okay? So capital losses are the exact opposite of capital gains. Instead of making money, you're losing money. Perhaps you bought XYZ stock at $20 and then it dropped $10 and you sold for a $10 loss. Believe it or not, you can actually write off these losses on your taxes to help reduce your tax burden. Moving on to part number six, let's talk about books and education, okay? So after you finish watching this video, and if you've made it this far, I appreciate you so much, okay? If you have not already dropped a like down below for the YT Algo, or if you are not subscribed to the channel yet, please go ahead and do both those things right now. Anyways, after you finish watching this video, what should you do next? What books should you read? Who should you listen to? How can you continue to further invest in yourself with education to increase your opportunities? Well, for starters, if you haven't already subscribed to my YouTube channel, go ahead and subscribe and watch as much of my content as you possibly can. Watch other personal finance YouTubers so that you can get different perspectives to really expand your knowledge. In addition to YouTube, I'd recommend that you check out these personal finance websites. Uh, TheInvestorPost.com, NerdWallet, Investopedia, Bankrate. These are all really great resources for financial information. Also, I've got a new website coming out soon called Mayo University. This is a website that I'm working very hard on to provide you guys with as much value as I possibly can, okay? There's gonna be courses on this website, free courses, premium courses, uh, different resources that you can use to continue building yourself, not only with your finances, but just with your life in general. So go to mayouniversity.com and enter your first name and email so that you can be notified whenever this website goes live. And as far as books, I have a large list of recommendations, okay? So here they are, The Psychology of Money, The Little Book of Common Sense Investing, A Beginner's Guide to the Stock Market, The Only Investment Guide You'll Ever Need, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, 
The Simple Path to Wealth. And then of course, you've got some much more dense books like The Intelligent Investor and Security Analysis, right? So these are all really amazing books that you can read to continue expanding your knowledge and trying to learn about investing from as many different perspectives as possible, okay? So I'll include links to all of these books down in the description below. And then finally, if you're somebody who enjoys listening to podcasts, what podcasts do I recommend, okay? So there are four that I would recommend. The first is the Personal Finance Podcast. We've also got the Bigger Pockets Money Podcast, the Rich Dad Show, and then finally, the Stacking Benjamins Show. And finally, part seven of the video, I wanna talk to you guys about the three biggest beginner investor mistakes that you should avoid if you truly wanna build wealth in the stock market. So the first mistake that I see a lot of beginner investors making is trying to time the market. So what exactly does timing the market look like, okay? Here you go. You wait to start investing because the market's too low but then the market starts going up and so you start investing, right? But then the market starts going down again and so you sell your stocks really quick and you lose some money. But then the market starts going up again, but this time you're like, well, let me just wait because the last time it went up, I bought, but then it dropped again and I sold for a loss. So let me just wait to make sure it's actually going up. And then the next thing you know it, it's going up and it's hitting all-time highs. And so you jump in and you start investing at all-time highs, but then it starts going down and you panic and you sell again for a loss. It's a disaster, okay? And that's exactly what timing the market looks like. Stop doing this. If you're investing in the market, most of you watching, I would say 99% of people watching this video are probably investing for the long term, meaning that you're buying stocks, you're buying ETFs, you're buying index funds for the next 10, 20, 30, possibly even 40 plus years. You are holding on to these investments for a very long time. And over the course of those decades, if you just continue holding on to your investments, dollar cost averaging money into the stock market every single month, then you'll be able to build massive wealth. But if you are constantly trying to time the market, buying and selling your investments at every single change in direction that the market makes, then you will never last. Stop trying to guess what you think the market's going to do because it's never gonna work. You're never gonna be able to guess it 100% of the time. Another mistake that I see a lot of investors making is lacking long-term perspective, okay? Unless you're day trading stocks for a living or buying and selling options, chances are you're probably investing in the stock market for the long term. A lot of investors will forget that this is a long term game. This is a marathon. The problem with forgetting about your time horizon is that you'll end up making very irrational decisions with your investments. For example, let's just say that for the past five years, you've been investing consistently into the stock market, dollar cost averaging $500 per month, but after five years, it doesn't seem like your investments are really going anywhere. However, what you're forgetting is that it typically takes about 10 years or more for your investments to really start compounding and growing exponentially. And so if you don't have a long-term perspective, you might end up selling your investments at year eight before you really gave them a chance to start growing and compounding. And the final big mistake that I see a lot of investors making is not understanding compound interest. So compound interest is when your interest earns interest on top of interest. You can think of compound interest like this. Money makes money and the money that makes money makes more money. It starts off really slow, right? As you can see from the chart here on the screen, compound interest is very slow at first, but the more you continue to invest, the more time your investments have to compound and grow, the more compounding growth will happen, which will exponentially build your wealth. If you guys have not already gotten your free stocks from Public and Webull, then I would highly recommend that you do that right now. Also, please remember to visit mayouniversity.com and enter your first name and email so that you can be notified as soon as that website goes live. I really hope that this was helpful. I really do. If you stayed and watched till the end, I mean, you're, you're incredible. Thank you so much. Make sure you drop a like down below for the YT Algo. You guys are amazing. And as always, I will see you again very soon. <laughs> Take care.